things. And, and this businessman um, in London that I had the Skype call with, he said that you know the number one reason that small businesses can don't don't last is because they do overspend and kind of then run into difficulty and problems. And if you can just uh, create what you can on your comfortable budget and uh, do that the best that you can, then somebody with money can see the potential from that and give you the money to help you, you know, to take it to the next level. So that was really great advice and that 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 um, made it very clear to us because even the first season of our show, we just had the cameras, well, and the second season too, just facing one way. We didn't even have the budget to flip the cameras and show the other people. So, you know, uh, we did everything um, financially speaking with what we what we actually had and worked out uh, and a way to do it. And also, I come from um, having created my own work in Paris from the school I went to, Jacques Lecoq, which uh, talks about, you know, really using what you might perceive as a constriction can be your best friend. Mm -hmm. Because if you have uh, everything available to you, sometimes that can be too, you know, you can be um, almost stars, you know, it can be hard to know where to begin. But if you have certain constraints from the beginning, that can actually make things easier. So um, that was helpful to know right at the onset. Yes, we gave ourselves lots of constrictions. We had one kitchen, <laughs> one kitchen, <laughs> one actor. We gave ourselves the whole one season. Day. They shoot the whole season. Yeah, on um, seasons. Yeah, but that kept in mind. It kept us in balance because in this business, you can quickly get off balance too, and then nobody wants to talk to you anymore. If you're desperate, exhausted, broke because you've you know mortgage the farm, like you were saying, and because you're you could make a bad so busy, decision. yeah, you end up making a bad decision. So this was what we could do, that we could do well, and still be happy in the process. And alive, so, yeah, so we went off topic, but basically starting with the end goal in mind, and then starting small with something that you can do towards that goal um, is the first step. And we would say with the creation of an idea, to give it the proper time it deserves. Um, like as artists, we know very, very deeply the pain of like you get excited and you really want a product and you really want people to see it. Like you want it out there as fast as humanly possible and to get that gratification. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard. You really want to do that, but the but things need their proper time. You know, we've really learned that. In fact, through this process, I think there's been many times when we wish things would have happened faster uh, than they did, but now in hindsight, we're like, oh, thank God they didn't. Because they, they didn't know what it was. Yeah, because if it had, I don't think we would have gotten to a lot of the places that we got. We've gone so deep with this character now and so deep with the storylines, and we're really grateful for that because it's been before... We welcome other people's insights and growth, but we needed that incubation uh, time. Yeah, and I think when you're uh, actually taking the time to create your own work, you, you want to indulge yourself a little bit, really, and really create what you really want to create. Because otherwise, you know, especially because I'm an actor, so coming from acting and a lot of other people's projects to, to, to spend the time developing my own idea, I wanted to make sure that it was really what I wanted to say. Um, and it, I mean, the, the character of Tuluma Grace, who uh, is the sort of central axis of the show, Feathers and Toads, took me about six months. Essentially, you know, I did stand up comedy, and somebody came to see my, my stand up and then um, suggested to me that, what, actually took me for lunch and said, What do you want to do? Why are you in Los Angeles? And I said, I wanted my own half an hour show, and I, I quite like to shoot on Paramount because I love Paramount. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love the gates and everything. <laughs> so it works out. I have an idea of you going to work on a bike. And um, so basically, uh, he said, you know, why don't you create your own show? Why don't you write it? And it was very intimidating to me because I'm not a writer. You know, I, 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 I wrote my own stand-up comedy, but that was a very different uh, kettle of fish than thinking about um, writing a screenwriting or anything. You know, I felt very unqualified for that. And, you know, I know a lot of people go to USC, UCLA, you know, serious screenwriters, and I just felt like, how can I sort of just jump in that, read a book from uh, Samuel French, and just do it? <laughs> you know, I felt like a bit of an imposter, so I didn't really know where to begin. And then after about six months, I started um, really thinking about the character. Uh, actually, when I was in my own kitchen, um, I was, I, oh, whenever I cook on my own, I speak out loud in French. To keep up my French, and um, and I danced in the kitchen because I had a dance teacher that said that you could, you know, overextend yourself a little bit with your frying an egg. 
And <laughs> so French people then to the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The corner. Thanks for that backup, Donald. <laughs> and um, the authentic French backing you up. And uh, so I was doing that, and I thought, hang on a minute, this might be an idea for a character. And I slowly, I sort of, uh, you know, thingy for thing with the flame, and made it a little bit bigger. But I, I took months of filming myself, and then sending, uh, sending my uh, basically improvisations to four different directors that I'd worked with around the world, and getting their help and input. So it was a very slow process, and I, I got like, um, you know, I made, uh, got, uh, made scrapbooks of pictures of things that inspired me, I read books that inspired me, and essentially I think, you know, if you go and see like a great work of art, like if you went to see Rodin and his thinker and things, you would see lots of preliminary sketches and drawings and then, you know, maybe bits of sculpture that he'd started and then released, and I think, for me, we went through the, the exact same process of that, but writing tons of stuff, filming tons of stuff, and um, really honing where the core of this uh, character was, because we were very clear we wanted a half an hour show, and we want like seven years of that, so we want a really deep character, and a really rich character. So we, we did give that a lot of time. Mary, is that okay? Yeah. Obviously, Mary is divine, uh, classically trained, uh, Scottish, speaking French, quite diversified. And that said, why did you settle on the Lula when I'm sure you had six million different ideas? Why did you go there? You were talking about long term plan. Why did you go with this? Well, idea? that's. When I went to the school I went to in Paris, Jacques Lecoq, they talk a lot about you only have you having your inner clan and it being like for example Charlie Chaplin and the clan, having one aspect of your personality. A bit like if you're a, a painter and you're you're a cartoonist saying you do a caricature and you maybe have a long nose or big ears or some essence uh, some part of yourself really deep inside that you can uh, bring to a higher level and that becomes your clan. And essentially that's where I found Tallulah being She's, she's my clown, essentially, and I, I've always been interested in physical comedy, and I basically wanted to combine everything that I really liked in one person. So she wears great vintage hats, and um, <laughs> nice gloves and things, and she's, yeah, so it's kind of, it was a very organic process. It wasn't like I thought, oh, I'd like to, I didn't start you know, it, it really came from the inside. Oh, so you didn't think merchandise and playing? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of the postcard. No, <laughs> and went back from there. Oh, and that brings up a good point to translate it to all the room because not everybody's an actor or whatever. I really feel like every writer, every director, every executive also has a story they're meant to help shepherd. There, there's certain stories that are just really yours to help bring out in whichever way you're doing it. And I think those end up being truly the ones we all remember. So if you're going to do it, I mean, this business is hard. It's really hard. That was actually our next point, is make sure it's exciting enough for you. Because what we found is you're going to spend sometimes a lifetime with some of these characters you create. Um, and certainly to get it off the ground, certainly if it's different or unique or unusual, it's not going to be right away that people are even going to respond to it sometimes. It takes a while to to build the base, so you know it starts with you, and hopefully, if you're lucky, like in the later tracks, it expands to a whole team of people that are now working on it, millions of dollars. But it starts with that initial thing, and you'll be with it forever. So it's like it better really have some juice for you. That's a very yeah. good question. Uh, I love the, in the evolution process. We talked to a couple of directors for the input and shaping up the script and the character and the shots. Were they your friends that didn't get paid, or were they people that you were auditioning? Like, it could have been that they become the director of the project. How did that work? They, and that's a really good question. Thank you. That's a really good question because I think it's you've got to be very careful of yourself in the development phase because you're quite vulnerable. So if you ask the wrong person for advice, they could end up destroying your idea, potentially freaking you out, making you feel insecure, or totally changing. Or running you. away with it potentially. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So I did think very carefully about who I showed that to, and I showed it to directors who I had worked with before. One of uh, the directors is one of my closest friends who gave me my first job 15 years ago, so he knows my work really well. And I would say to ask somebody's advice who you know cares about you, who's not trying to just shoot you down, you know what I mean? Who has, uh, also, you obviously don't want just somebody just to sit there saying, yes, you do want, well, constructive criticism. 
Um, but I just showed it to a few really select people who I really respected their work as well and their opinion. Um, yeah. And me. Yeah, and on horse <laughs> Me, who right away... Are you a director? Yeah, I am. I'm a producer. I, and right when she showed it to me, I was very attached to... I was very excited about the possibilities of the digital world and what was possible and the way you could... Because, yeah, as a creative, you know, she wanted to play that character, obviously. So just even to just develop it and write it, to me, was not enough. I, I felt like, no, we got to get you... We, we need to let people see you at this, because she is it. And I knew we had, I have my own cameras, and my husband's a DP, and um, I knew we could do this. So that was one of, to me, there was no question about it. We needed to show to Lua Grace, not just write the, uh, yeah. and so yes, there were people, to answer the other part of your question, that did not get paid or whatever. It was a passion project for a select group of friends, me and her and my husband and Katie, who came on board as a skills photographer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we were very, very fortunate that uh, right at the right each sort of point on the journey so far, which has been two and a half years that we've been working on this, a person has crossed our path and taken it on to a level. Like like uh, Holly mentioned, like skills photographer. I would have never thought I particularly needed a skills photographer. But turned out I did, and she designed uh, the posters <laughs> and the website, and we've got memes and did a lot of our marketing, and um, sh you know, so yeah. But I think that came from us spending a long time nurturing the idea, so it was very clear to people what our idea was, and then that if that excited the person, like with Katie, she could take the idea and run with it and do what she wanted with it. That was along the lines um, of where our heart was. Before. Well, that is another point. It was because. Because her vision was so clear, it was easy for me to add my my skills to it and, and add to the next part of it. And I think every step of the way, that's been the case. That then together we got really clear and it expanded. And because of that, it's funny. Now we'll go to festivals and things like that. And people, I'll never forget this one guy. He said, he goes, I imagine Tallulah's the kind of girl that could tell if it's boxed wine. <laughs> and I was like, I think that's true, true, but you know, like, people are starting to, you know, and then once you've got that and you've really done your job, then you can collaborate with others and it can be a lot of fun and you don't have to be all weird and whatever about it, you're ready for it to expand. Because uh, as some, an executive told me recently, you know, as creatives, we forget, because we're so focused on our side of things, we forget that what they're thinking of on the other end when they're talking to you is sometimes literally pouring millions of dollars into your idea. Well, wow, they've got a whole nother, you know, we don't sometimes think about what they're doing on their side, but it's like, you better do, have done, spent your time and your job and, and, and done it really well. And then to also make it fun, because at the end of the day, then we have to work together. Uh, for a very long time, for a lot of hours, and it's like, it, 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 it's it, 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 just to go back to the importance of really loving what your characters are, it, uh, you know, especially now with uh, social media and what the um, capacity to tweet and do uh, Instagram and everything from forming part of your show's sort of reach. Uh, if you have a character that you really love, then you can um, tweet and do Instagrams as that character. It can be really fun. It can be an extension of the show. So uh, that's another reason to really know as much as you can about your uh, characters right at the beginning because you can develop them through social media which is a brilliant place yeah. 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 Sorry, yeah. 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 we won't talk that much about that topic number two <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but yeah does anyone have any questions so far that they yeah, yeah. so once you find the partner that you both did um, and you decide that you like the idea you want to work together how do you formalize the relationship to make sure that there's some kind of structure, um, you know, working together, and uh, also to ensure that you know you're you're respecting each other's um, talent, boundaries, etc. Do you guys have a contract? Like, how does that work out? How do you start? That? I would say so that's an ongoing 
process, just like any relationship. I think you have to build on it. And you have to be willing, though, to have those kinds of conversations, which is hard. Because you're, you know, it's so exciting. It's like falling in love. It's no different than relationships. Yeah, it's like falling in love, and you don't want to have that prenup conversation. Or too late. But that's kind of what it is. Yes, you must have it. You must be clear that you guys are. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's a writing, right? Uh, yes, Louise. <laughs> um, you know, with us, I, I would say, again, every situation is different, too. With Mari and I, we were very, very close friends uh, before we even started this and had no intention of working together. It just sort of happened organically because we had this goal group of two. Um, <laughs> we never expanded to anyone else. Um, and every week we would get together and talk about our goals, and slowly over time we realized our goals were absolutely the same. Um, and that was a big help. Had we not known that already, we probably needed to have much more discussions than we had. Yeah. And even then, we had lots of discussions about what we were thinking. Yeah, also, we both had bad experiences with other oh, producing yeah. partners, so we knew exactly what we didn't want, and we knew what we wished we'd known at the beginning, as in whether or not we were compatible with the goals of the other person. Do you know what I mean? And what sort of level of integrity and whatnot. And I think there was one of these uh, goal groups that, um, that Holly just mentioned where Holly asked me, what's your ambition? What do you still really want to do? Or what would make you happy? You know? And I said, I just want to be filming on Paramount. You know, Paramount's my thing. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, are you sure? Because there's been times where you've been filming before where you haven't been that happy. And it was a really interesting question because not many people ask you. You know, they just say, oh, yeah, of course, Paramount. Of course, you can cycle to work in this. And, um, and that was a really great question because she made me think. And I, I thought for a few days, when was the last time I was genuinely happy working? And it had been when I was doing a play in London. And I was really happy because I was in a community of like-minded people. And it was going on for three or four months. So I had the stability of a few months of work. And so uh, the next school group, I said to her, you know, actually, what I... What I really want to do is be a, a part of a community. And so that, coupled with the, getting the idea for Tulula at the same time, really married the idea of, well, if that's what we want, we're going to create it. So we came at things from the inside out, as it were. We, we knew what atmosphere we wanted to create, what we, what we wanted to work in, do you know what I mean? And first of all, it was uh, me and Holly, and then her husband, and then it grew from there, bringing in people uh, that luckily, you know, all had our backs, we all had our back. it came from very much an organic process from uh, that I'd never experienced before. Yeah, so I mean, I guess in answer to your question, it, again, like relationships, you know, a lot of times on your first date, you don't want to be talking about how we're going to divide up the, you know, assets or whatever, you know, like, <laughs> it's a tricky day, but you always have to be communicating and being honest, you know, right from the start to figure out if you guys are on the same page or not, and yes, you're going to have to have a contract at some point, and yeah, you're going to have to think about that exit strategy for if it doesn't work out, which no one wants to think about while everything's all joyous and lovely. Um, thank you. It seems like in the process of development, you have so little control, right? Yeah. So one of the things that you do have control is social media. How did you develop your characters uh, through social media? Well, yeah, that's a really interesting question. And at the beginning of handling social media, I did not enjoy it. In fact, I went to the library and bought a book out and had to tweet. I didn't know, <laughs> didn't know all that meant. It felt like a different language. I felt really behind the eight ball, you know, with all that. And um, I met this guy uh, who's very successful. I had a show on YouTube who's very successful. And I was sort of think, I said to him after a Q&A, after a panel, you know, don't you find social media? Do you find it, you know, how are you finding social media? And he said, I love it. And because I didn't want to appear negative, I said, oh, me too, I love it. <laughs> and then I thought the next day I woke up and thought, how can I really love this? Um, and I thought, I'm just going to start tweeting as my character. And it, because I do come from stand-up comedy and theater, especially, but especially stand-up comedy, it's such um, an immediate storytelling form. You know, you're getting, a, you're getting a response straight away from your audience, whether a, a joke's working or not. And I thought, you can actually still have that same relationship through Twitter and social media, which is really exciting. Um, so I did shift my whole mindset on it and um, just started saying darling every tweet and champagne and bubble baths. And then people I started sort of expanding on the brand that then people knew. You know, people started playing along and it became really fun. You know, it's, it's really it's fun. I really we realize it. now it's part of the storytelling, which yeah, is really fun. Yeah, people have given us great ideas. Like, 
somebody said at one time at one of the Digital Hollywoods, and I couldn't agree more, uh, that this is the most exciting time to be a storyteller because now you can tell stories across all sorts of platforms. So nowadays, you know, we learned this, it's hindsight, but I would approach every project from this point forward this way where it's like, how is this story to be told across all the different landscapes that I have? It's no longer just a film or just a TV show. It is that film or TV show that could be your staple, that's your, your meat and potatoes. But then there's all these little appetizers and hors d'oeuvres and little extras that are like on Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or um, all these different ways you can have your story being told. Um, we do really that. Exciting. Yeah, we played last season we didn't have enough uh, viewers yet for it to really get fun, but we had already had the idea, and we know that it will grow. We made handles for our characters, and we would bother each other back and forth on Twitter all the time, just as poking characters, yeah. as <laughs> characters. And sure enough, some people would tweet and get embroiled in our, <laughs> our little conversation, and they would be back and forth with us. And um, yeah, it was really fun. It's like Twitter prof. I don't know. Yeah. Um, hold on. I'm not sure they understand. Everybody knows your character, but you have to understand Holly is also playing. Oh, yes. Okay, I was going to ask right. that. Oh. Oh. I am an actor. Oh. Yes. Yes. So they borrowed you out because the princess here wants to play <laughs> art. Art. Uh, art. High art. High art. So, yes. Our culture <laughs> is art. And, um, my character Holster is the suit. I'm, yes. I'm the producer of the bottom line. Yes. In the second season of our show, actually, every single episode, I'm bug bugging her, trying to have her have collaborators on the show. She wants to do it. Her she way, now never herself. Had a <laughs> <laughs> to get more followers. So I'm putting everything from can can girl to a cat into the episode. <laughs> Anything that might fit. So it sounds like you had on Twitter. You were actually creating a Twitter version. Exactly. Oh, yes. 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 Which yes. 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 is brilliant. Yes. 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 <laughs> and I would say as well to be, you know, just, just going back to like what our early point of being very clear with your end goal, which I think is really important, but then being really open to how you get there, because you don't know what might just happen, and you don't want to necessarily block something, because, you know, I was at um, an art opening a year and a half ago, and met this French PR girl, and because, because, because I speak French a little bit, we started speaking, and she said, oh, you know, I should introduce you to this cabaret company, because I, uh, I do PR for them, and then... I, we met the cabaret people for a coffee, and, and they said, come and see our show. And then their opening act drops out, and they phoned me and said, could you open our show? <laughs> and I've never done Tallulah Grace live. <laughs> but, you know, and obviously I freaked out for a while, and then wrote something in the night and did a, did open the show for 15 minutes. And then that became um, the residency that I now have with the cabaret company hosting as Tallulah. So, you know, I would have never imagined, mm. oh, what I'll do is I'll start, mm. you know, working with a French cabaret company yeah. <laughs> in <laughs> L.A. That would not, I would never... Yes, we planned all And this. singing. You know, I'm a mime artist, but I'm singing <laughs> in French in this cabaret. I would never <laughs> imagine that. But um, so I would say be clear, but then be also really open, because you don't know what uh, exciting adventures are going to come your way. Well, and I would say you can be clear, be, uh, you can be open because you're clear. You know, yeah. Um, because you're clear, you can know right away whether something sticks with your brand or whether it doesn't, and so you can play a little. And then people can see that they can play with you. Like the cabaret yeah. people, they could see, oh, that character would go well with our characters. And so you're you're making quite a strong proposition from the outset that other people can see how they could interact. Yeah. I will say a bold statement too, because all of you probably have ideas you want to explore and all that stuff. Uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. Again, I wouldn't have known this, but after two and a half years of doing what we've been doing, I think YouTube is like so fantastic for development. We were never, now there's a lot of people that want to go for YouTube as a model to make money. That was never our plan. Our plan was really more of almost marketing because an attorney a while back had suggested to us, you know, you can get leverage from having audience, from having fans. So that when it's time to go pitch your show and whatever, you know, it helps get you that leverage. So we were looking more for that. But what happened in the process is that it did become this incredible development tool. I mean, obviously you don't want to just slap stuff up there and ruin your brand because it wasn't 
developed enough, but at the same time, you'll always be developing further. So you start with something, and that's what happened to us, is we started with something we were proud of. It's not where we were going to end up, but it was something that we started with. And the audience started giving us all great this ideas. feedback. This one guy on Twitter said, oh, you remind me of Clara Bow. And I was like, oh, great. So then we did a whole melodramatic episode where I was basically trying to be Clara Bow, making a ham sandwich. You know, so it was really exciting when people suggesting that you you know, that inspires you, and then you're like, oh, this is, it's a really interactive experience. And you find out what your audience wants. You have your own little test market, because it's like, yeah, we don't, she always says this, and I'll let you say it, but you don't want to create in a box. I mean, at the end of the day, if yeah. your show's no. going to be a value, it, it better be a value to someone other than you. you're co-creating it with your fans. You. Yeah, yeah. So it's a conversation. Because somebody um, at the school that I went to in Paris at Le Coq, uh, the teacher was very clear, said, if the man on the street does not understand your work, then you're not doing your job. Then it's pretentious when you're just doing it for yourself as an indulgence. And I think the internet right now is great because you can get that feedback and you can know what hits. And, uh, you know, I've um, started working with a hat maker for my hats. And this woman who follows the show through Instagram uh, owns a vintage store up in Seattle and she just sent me two hats from the 1930s last week, which is really amazing. I'm now we're contributing to our wardrobe budget. Which I love. That. And that should be encouraged, by the way. <laughs> Quite a big head, but you know. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting to know what people are resonating with and then you're like, okay, hats are. People do like dressing up feather bows. At Christmas, people are sending me pictures through Twitter of themselves wearing feather boas and stuff. So, but my character likes to wear feather boas. Uh, well, and, so you and know season what two is. was directly a result of what the feedback we got from season one. Because season one, we would do like the, her cooking show, and then we would leave the cameras rolling as if, of course, all of it was in character, but as if you were seeing a little bit of behind the scenes. And we had done just a little bit of that the first season, but everybody liked that part so much that when you, if you see the second season. You know, we hurry up through the cooking part because Tulu is a horrible cook anyway. Um, <laughs> um, and it's mostly what's happening between her and the crew, you know, behind the scenes. And it's because that, which was good news to us because that was going to be more of what the half hour show was going to be anyway, with her life uh, beyond. So we were I think thrilled. We should probably just say what the show is because we haven't talked oh, right. about it. <laughs> so basically, the show is Feathers and Toast, and it's about Tulula Grace, who thinks that she is an amazing cooking show host, a la Julia Child, and she can barely pull off a sandwich. Yeah. But she is desperately trying to inspire the lonely cook to make an effort for themselves in the kitchen by wearing feather boas and thinking about Chanel and high art. <laughs> she may be that lonely cook. Could you, like, come in? Well, I'm going to bring it up there. Can you look at it? What? Is it? 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 Is I don't have internet here. I mean, you know, It's a tomato soup recipe, and it consists of bread, tomato soup, and a bit of lettuce. <laughs> and that's a real recipe, darling. I researched that. Must have been a oh, okay. Season five, episode one. So where did you get the bread? Where did you put the bread? You just put the soup on the bread, darling. You just spoon it out with your oh. tomato soup, Campbell's, and then you need to watch season two, episode five. <laughs> Another dramatic tomato soup sandwich. Um, yeah. May I have one of those postcards? Yes, darling. Yes. Actually, yeah. I would like to know if anybody in the room has been inspired by this with one of their ideas and are thinking they oh, want to yeah. take it to the next level. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of things, but the idea of, of well, first thing, energetically, mm -hmm. how you two are, are matched, <laughs> very different, yeah. and yet very complementary, and I can see that. So that's the first thing that I noticed. And, and the second thing is how deeply you spent in your core search that you really understood the character yeah. <clears throat> first and it was kind of in a you know in a very it's like like a incubation.